This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. We're here uh, uh, today to talk about uh, prevention of type 1 diabetes with uh, vitamin D and, and sun exposure. Casual sun exposure is the way most of us obtain the majority of our vitamin D. I was uh, studying uh, the uh, UC uh, logo with my colleagues, uh, Cedric Garland, and I've, I've uh, looked this over with Sharif Moore, and we noticed the motto, let there be light. This is translated from the Latin fiat lux, Lux is really more properly translated as sunlight. Sunlight was a symbol of clarity and reason to the Romans and the, and the Greeks. And so I think uh, if, if the regents won't object, we should think of the uh, slogan for today, the, the uh, University of California motto is, let there be sunlight. Would, would you be all right with that, Carol? Yes. Okay, very good. I have uh, no conflicts of interest to uh, declare and no proprietary relationship to the sun. <laughs> we have some objectives today, and I'd like to uh, just review those. First, I want to describe the prevalence of vitamin D deficiency in terms of sun avoidance, and also in terms of the key epidemiologic variables of person, place, and time. Next, we'll identify at least two uh, items of evidence suggesting a protective association between vitamin D and sunlight and incidence of type 1 diabetes. And finally, list at least three ways that we can address uh, vitamin D deficiency and have a positive impact on public health. I think we're now uh, have shown that uh, through various studies by various authors that there are seven, cancer of 17 sites that's associated with vitamin D deficiency and just Yesterday, I believe, uh, Rafael Cuomo had a uh, paper accepted on multiple myeloma. So now we're up to 18. So this objective will be easy, easily met today. When we look at the variable of person and think about who's at risk for vitamin D deficiency, the answer is nearly everyone. Uh, three out of four people in uh, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey were below 32 nanograms per ml, which we flag here at UCSD as clinical vitamin D insufficiency. Uh, that um, is also uh, um, a problem in terms of uh, severe vitamin D deficiency. About a quarter of the U.S. population is below 17.8 nanograms per ml, which uh, is nearly universally recognized as vitamin D deficient. Uh, we also, uh, when, when the uh, NHANES uh, vans go out, they, this, these data are somewhat seasonally skewed because they go to the northern cities in the summer and the southern cities in the winter just for uh, logistical reasons. So the actual distribution may be much worse than this. Uh, but this is uh, probably the best data we have uh, to illustrate the crying uh, need for uh, vitamin D supplementation and more sun exposure. In terms, again, of person, women are at uh, much higher risk for vitamin D deficiency than men. This may be an occupational phenomenon. It, it, uh, it's it's a, a little difficult to explain, but it certainly has a lot of implications in terms of breast cancer, uterine cancer, endometrial cancer, uh, osteoporosis, and other uh, diseases uh, for which women uh, suffer disproportionately. Pigmentation is a risk factor for vitamin D deficiency, and it turns out that uh, heavily pigmented skin is, is associated with severe vitamin D deficiency, below 17.8 nanograms per ml. The National Institutes of Health concentrate a great deal on racial disparities in, in, uh, in, in uh, health outcomes, and um, uh, quite a bit of this might be explainable by differences in vitamin D status. 
Uh, p people with heavy pigmentation can make vitamin D. It just takes, takes longer. It takes more prolonged exposure. But this shows the tenfold increase among African Americans uh, followed by uh, uh, <coughs> other races, Asians and Hispanics. Body mass index is associated with vitamin D deficiency. We see body mass index associated or uh, w perhaps indirectly associated with uh, colon cancer with uh, heart disease, and there may be an underlying deficiency of, of vitamin D at work here. And finally, time. We're coming to a new variable now. Season has a profound influence on the risk of vitamin D deficiency. And here you see in the winter, uh, the uh, referent category is set at one. And in the summertime, uh, people are at a, uh, a two-thirds reduced risk of, of vitamin D deficiency even in the NHANES uh, data. And then in the fall and spring, we see sort of an intermediate uh, risk. So season is, is, is very important. And we'll see uh, some seasonal trends in a moment in, in diabetes. So we, uh, I think yesterday, saw many uh, examples of uh, the latitudinal gradient in cancer risk. And this is an illustration that explains those diagrams called the smiley, where the lowest risk is in the equatorial areas, and then risk increases as you go north or south in the equator. And you can see that uh, when you're at the equator, on uh, the equinox, the, the path length of uh, the sunlight is, is greatly reduced compared to being at higher latitude. And it's a, uh, a function you can describe. It's the, uh, the cosine of the latitude. And that accounts for a lot of the UVB flux. And, and uh, you can see also we have a, a little bit of a model here. I don't know if you've ever shown a flashlight against a wall, but if you turn the flashlight, the, rays, the energy is spread out. And that's similar in the UVB radiance uh, compared to perpendicular rays. And here's a person with no shadow at all standing on the equator. And here's a person at 45 degrees. This is not to scale, obviously. <laughs> and, and as a lot of you know who are interested in the environment, the atmosphere is really very thin uh, in, around the, it's, uh, so that, that also is uh, uh, exaggerated. So there's a uh, phenomenon called the shadow rule, and it, on, a, on days like this, you really have to be out in the, at, at midday, and if your shadow is longer than you are, it's very difficult to make vitamin D because the UVB rays, which are way beyond the purple light and the UVA, are very fragile and they're filtered out by the optical depth of the atmosphere. So if your shadow is longer than you are tall, then you won't be able to make vitamin D. I, uh, I took this slide to my son's uh, trigonometry class and they were very interested in it because this is a very special 45-45 uh, degree right triangle. And uh, there were amazed to see the uh, application of, of, uh, of geometry in, in public health. Well, now I'd like to kind of turn the clock back to the beginning of the previous century in talking about diabetes, type 1 diabetes. And at that time in history, uh, if a child presented who was thin and weak and thirsty and failing to thrive, um, it was a fatal diagnosis. Uh, there was no treatment. Uh, the uh, child would slip into a diabetic coma in a ward like this. The uh, doctor would shake his head, and the parents would stand around the bed and, and wait for the inevitable. And that was true until Sir Frederick Banting and Charles Best, Banting and Best, discovered a way to isolate a compound from the pancreas. And it's a, a compound that occurs in the Isles of Langerhans which sounds like a nice sunny place for a vacation, but it's actually a, a region in the pancreas where the beta cells uh, are uh, populated. And it's an isolated place because the pancreas is also secreting uh, powerful digestive enzymes, proteolytic enzymes that will break down uh, delicate proteinaceous hormones like the, ones, uh, like the one ide uh, isolated by, by Banting and Best. And that hormone isolated from the Isles of Langerhans was, is called insulin. And they developed a technique where uh, you, you don't grind up the pancreas, you actually uh, ligate it and get the uh, secretions from these Isles of Langerhans that uh, are secreted by the beta cells 
living in those uh, aisles. So this is uh, Banting and Best with one of their experimental subjects, Marjorie, uh, who should also be acknowledged. Marjorie uh, lived for 90 days without a pancreas, surviving on the insulin of her uh, canine uh, brethren. And Banting and Best uh, learned how to isolate this in insulin. So it must have been quite a moment when uh, Banting and Best came to this uh, diabetes ward and, and uh, uh, asked if they could administer insulin to uh, a, a child in a diabetic coma. The, uh, one can imagine the child's eyes would flutter and they'd wake up very uh, thirsty. So let's look at season now in diabetes in the uh, Department of Defense. We have a database, and in the, the Navy, we love acronyms. Uh, it's called the CHAMPS database, the Career History Archival Medical and Personnel System. Just rolls off the tongue. And uh, <laughs> it was used to ascertain first hospitalizations of outpatient visits for type 1 diabetes mellitus. And we found an annual incidence rate that was comparable to what we see in, in uh, civilians. Uh, incidence rates were twice as high, however, in African Americans than in whites. This could perhaps be ascribed to the uh, difference in risk for, di for uh, vitamin D deficiency. And we also saw the seasonal pattern, which I'll uh, uh, blow up here. And we, uh, for some reason, one of the uh, journal editor uh, reviewers insisted on smoothing this figure. But you can see the seasonal variation and uh, the uh, represented by the dotted lines. And uh, we see that it uh, peaks annually in the winter and spring. And the odds ratio compared to the summer is 4.6. So when you're in the vitamin D nadir of uh, winter and spring, risk of being diagnosed with incident diabetes is, is much higher. And we know that these are incident cases because uh, diabetes is disqualifying in the military. So these are new cases of insulin requiring diabetes in a, uh, in a young, well, an older population for type 1 diabetes, but in a young population, relatively speaking, uh, for me. Now we see our diabetes smiley. And you may remember uh, diagrams like this from, from yesterday. Uh, we see very uh, low rates of type 1 diabetes in equatorial areas, Barbados, Bogota, uh, uh, and uh, very high rates in Tierra del Fuego in the southern hemisphere, and also in the Sweden and Finland and Aberdeen and uh, areas in the higher high latitude areas in the north. And uh, we uh, published this in, in Diabetologia in 2008. We were very interested in, uh, in some of the outliers. You, you might notice Sardinia, Italy, up there at the top. Uh, presumably, they eat a lot of sardines in Sardinia, which are rich in vitamin D. And yet, they have high risk of, uh, of type 1 diabetes. And, and uh, the um, explanation appears to be uh, that they have a, a polymorphism, a, a FOK, F -O -K polymorphism, which you have to be careful when pronouncing. But it, it conveys a higher risk of, of uh, type 1 diabetes. And uh, we see, as expected, a, a high rate in Finland, which is at extraordinarily high latitude and has recently suffered from a, uh, a high increase in the rate of type 1 diabetes. So uh, it, it turns out, as you might expect, that opportunities for vitamin D photosynthesis are quite limited in, in, in Finland. The whole country is above 60 degrees north latitude, and there are parts of the uh, country above the Arctic Circle where the sun never comes up at all for at least some part of the year. So. Uh, as, as you can see, uh, this is a kind of a seasonal picture of uh, some, some folks in Finland. And even if you drive a convertible in Finland, <laughs> you, you can't make a lot of vitamin D. Uh, the shadows are, are quite long, and uh, you really are compelled to cover your skin, which is the main vitamin D producing organ. In uh, 2001, Elena Hyponen and Associates uh, looked at a birth cohort study in Finland. They took uh, children who were born in 1966 and followed them for, for outcome until 1997. And they looked at the frequency and usual dose of uh, vitamin D as a supplement. 
And these are the results for the frequency. If uh, they took some vitamin D, if the, if the children, child was administered some vitamin D or even uh, regular doses or even some occasional doses, they enjoyed a, a remarkable decrease in the risk of type 1 diabetes. And at the time, in 1966, the usual dose was 2,000 IU a day. Uh, that was the standard. And uh, as, as you can see, uh, dose is, is a remarkable predictor of diabetes risk in this cohort as well. Now, unfortunately, diabetes, uh, type 1 diabetes, has been increasing rapidly in Finland over the uh, recent time, since 1960, up until 2005. It's increased uh, you know, over threefold from you know, uh, roughly 20 to over 65, and now is about the highest uh, in the world. In 1964, the recommended dose for children of vitamin D was 4,500 IU. And these children were remarkably healthy. Uh, they did not suffer any uh, side effects from, from this daily dose of 4,500 IU. And they're uh, neonates, you know, in some cases. Uh, so the dose per kilogram is quite, quite high. And that was the standard of care in 1964, until 1964, when the dose was reduced to 2,000 IU out of some uh, misguided public health uh, requirement. <laughs> now in 75, uh, uh, that 2,000 IU dose was again halved to 1,000 IU. This is a very, what we call an unfortunate observational study. It's, a, it's instructive, but it's very unfortunate. And then uh, at this uh, major inflection point, out of a misguided sense of internationalism, perhaps, the uh, Finnish uh, government decided to reduce the intake to 400 IU, which matched the U.S. Uh, intake at the time. And we see the, the, perhaps the result here. Association isn't causation, but uh, th this is pretty difficult to explain uh, in any other way. So um, when uh, analyzing the results from the birth cohort study I showed you before that uh, temporal trend slide, uh, Hypona and Associates uh, concluded that the uh, increase in the incidence of type 1 diabetes might be related to changes in compliance and with dose recommendations. Could be. Yeah. <laughs> uh, discussions for increasing the dose might be indicated. You, you think? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And then the third conclusion is very difficult to uh, understand. Uh, we suggest, but, however, before any changes are made, that health workers ensure that the infants are at least getting 400 IU. Uh, it, it really uh, shows how once a policy is ensconced in the mantle of, of a uh, official recommendation, it's, it's quite difficult to change. In 2012, there was an uh, effort to, rate, to double the 400 IU to 800, a uh, very conservative step, but it, I, I don't believe it succeeded yet. Well, now let's turn to, uh, back to the uh, Department of Defense, and uh, Dr. Haney and Dr. Hollis had mentioned uh, the uh, uh, DOD uh, Serum repository. This study used serum from the Armed Forces Health Surveillance Center, which is an amazing resource for vitamin D uh, studies. We can do what we call a nested case control study and look at uh, subsequent experience of people with low vitamin D and high vitamin D and follow them prospectively over time. So we did this for a thousand controls and a thousand su uh, uh, subjects who went on to later develop type 1 diabetes. So it's a form of prospective study. We uh, matched the healthy control to the case on the date of blood draw, and that was very important because season is such an important predictor of, of uh, risk. And we'll also uh, with age and length of uh, enlisted service and, and uh, gender. And then we calculated odds ratios by quintile. And this is a shot of the uh, DOD Serum Repository in Silver Spring, Maryland. There are 15 freezers, and uh, they ha hold more than 50 million specimens, serial specimens in many cases of, uh, of uh, blood sera from uh, military active duty members. And uh, they're 
they're chilled by pairs of compressors on the, on the roof of each uh, freezer. And then in turn, the building itself is air conditioned because the uh, compressors throw off a lot of heat. And there's an interior shot of the uh, specimens in storage racks. Uh, so it's really a, a wonderful resource. Well, here's what we found for type 1 diabetes. And if you look at the uh, folks who were above 40 nanograms per ml, and we, we define their risk at 1, we see a uh, increase in risk, particularly in comparison with the lowest, the, uh, lowest quintile. So there's a 3.5-fold increase in, in uh, diabetes risk. And this is in nanograms per ml. You can see that there's a, a linear trend. Uh, these, uh, there are confidence intervals around those uh, bars. And, but there is a trend, a downward trend, that's significant and linear. And in fact, you can plot this. Uh, y equals mx plus b. You might remember that mantra from the slope intercept in your geometry class. I, I showed this to uh, Gregory's geometry class, too, and they were uh, really pleased that you could use uh, y equals mx plus b for something so productive. So what's the uh, physiological explanation for vitamin D's effect in, in prevention of a type 1 diabetes? Well, it's thought that type 1 diabetes is an unusual complication of common childhood enterovirus infections, in which uh, uh, reach the, uh, can reach the pancreas. And in a normal islet cell, there is this barrier function, this fi fibroblast. The, the pancreas is very friable and, and uh, loose. It's about the size of your hand. And it, uh, it, but it's, um, there are these regions, these isles, described by Paul Langerhans in 1865, where these beta cells are protected from the other cells in the pancreas by, by uh, these fibroblasts. And in a state of vitamin D deficiency, the capsule in which the beta cells exist disassociates. And that pr provides an opportunity for invasion by pathogens. And then there's an autoimmune attack, and the beta cells are, are uh, depleted, and eventually uh, they're destroyed. And that's why uh, vitamin D can't uh, restore uh, pancreatic, uh, pancreatic function in, in, in diabetes, but it can prevent it. These are uh, normal islet cells from our Department of Pathology, and you can see the uh, the barrier and the beta cells happily producing insulin. Well, one presumes they're happy. I guess they're at least producing insulin. We know that much. And here, unfortunately, is the situation in insulitis when these beta cells are destroyed and clearly unhappy looking. Uh, they're being, uh, they're turning black and they're not producing insulin. So now I'd like to just turn to. Uh, all the myriad outcomes associated with vitamin D deficiency. And I, I think uh, Dr. Haney has remarked on how when you see, uh, it, it's not uncommon in, when there's a deficiency of a micronutrient that's fundamental to so many different physiological processes to see a myriad of, of health outcomes. And I think now we're up to uh, 18 different cancers, thanks to Raphael's paper. Uh, we'll have to update th this uh, review. Uh, we have a, a type 1 diabetes, uh, stress fractures, multiple sclerosis from uh, Cassandra Munger and Associates, also using serum from the Armed Forces Health Surveillance Center. We have uh, seasonal influenza. It's seasonal for a reason. Uh, muscle pain, weakness, incident, uh, incipient asthma, uh, the, the uh, inherent asthma, not, not the allergic asthma so much, but... Uh, we see pregnancy outcomes and complications, uh, and also uh, heart disease and hypertension benefits from vitamin D. These are data from uh, on serum vitamin D levels from the Harvard Health Professionals cohort, and you can see a, a marked decrease in risk of myocardial infarction, sudden death in people who uh, are at higher levels of vitamin D compared to those at lower levels. And this was adjusted for almost every covariate imaginable, including body mass index and other things that are independently associated with vitamin D status. Here we see uh, 
the uh, relationship w with a stress fracture, and this is a study from our group. We looked at uh, uh, female recruits who were trained at uh, various uh, facilities, and we found that um, if they had higher vitamin D levels, they had a greatly reduced risk of stress fracture of the tibia or fibula. And this was a very acute effect. We uh, mentioned this study earlier with uh, Cassandra Munger and Alberto Ashirio and others, uh, including Dr. Hollis, on uh, uh, serum vitamin D and risk of uh, subsequent multiple sclerosis. Uh, and th this is an incident study, uh, nested case control design that used data from the serum repository. So we can see a, a strong protective effect and uh, you, you wonder if uh, higher levels could could uh, eradicate multiple sclerosis. There's a strong latitude effect that's been documented for, for many years. These are some of the uh, conditions we could, that could be immediately benefited by uh, vitamin D supplementation. Uh, uh, down at the bottom we see the preeclampsia, the, the uh, hypertension episodes uh, uh, surrounding childbirth, uh, fractures, stress fracture, uh, uh, upper respiratory infection, asthma, multiple sclerosis. And then finally, uh, longer term potential benefits, bladder cancer, pancreas, uh, breast cancer, colon cancer, and uh, certainly osteoporosis. And these are uh, <coughs> displayed uh, uh, according to the amount of the disease you, you wish to prevent and the dose required to, or associated with that reduction, that level of reduction. So now I uh, want to turn back to Finland, and uh, this is a study of all-cause mortality, which is kind of the bottom line in, in public health, and uh, mortality from any cause. And this was just an observational study of 1,136 uh, Finnish men and women, and uh, they were free of cancer and, and, and cardiovascular disease at the time of the uh, study when it began. The uh, mean baseline was 17.5 nanograms, which, you know, might be a little high for Finland. I mean, you, you might be surprised that it's that high, but there was apparently some supplement use, fortunately, going on. There were 87 deaths during nine years of follow-up, and these are the causes of death, uh, coronary va vascular disease, uh, uh, cancer, and, and others. And what we see is that there was a uh, marked reduction in mortality uh, with a high dose. It was about, about half, 5% in the high group and about 9% in the low group. So if you were above 20.3 nanograms, you, you had about uh, half the risk of a uh, fatal outcome during this follow-up as people in the lower group. Uh, now in Baltimore, uh, the Women's Health and Aging Study found a similar effect. The uh, uh, baseline serum was a little higher in Baltimore, 20.3 nanograms, not, not substantially higher. And the uh, outcomes were respiratory disease, cancer, coronary vascular disease, and there were 72 months of follow-up. And here we see an uh, even more profound effect in, in terms of quartiles in uh, mortality. So uh, the highest uh, in, in only had 8% mortality and the lowest had 20%. And now uh, uh, we're, we can turn to an Italian study, uh, the Invecchiari in Chianti, the Aging in Chianti study. We presume that these uh, subjects drank some Chianti, at least occasionally, but uh, we were mainly interested in the vitamin D exposure in this group. And uh, the uh, <coughs> population was uh, above 65 years old. And even under the uh, Tuscan sun, they only had 16 nanograms per ml of circulating uh, vitamin D on average measured in enrollment. And these are the outcomes. Coronary vascular disease and cancer, the main causes of death that Bill Grant mentioned uh, earlier. And we see a uh, really profound effect of, uh, of, of vitamin D in, in uh, increasing survival. Fourfold difference. So what's a, what's a good target? Our group has been looking at a variety of outcomes, and 
We've concluded that the, uh, in terms of benefits versus risk, the 80 nanograms per ml is probably a good target. It's, it, it may be a little high in terms of uh, uh, the observational studies of people with uh, minimal clothing who, who uh, enjoy living at, at a low latitude, but it's within the physiological limits. And it, it's probably the level where, since we see these dose response curves or lines, uh, that where we'd see the maximum public health benefit. So to get to 80 nanograms per ml for most of us who start with maybe 25, which is the uh, U.S. median, we have to take about 6,000 to uh, 7,000 IU a day. And if we do that, we can uh, see a we'll see a real effect if we can move the population vitamin D level up to 660 to 80 nanograms per ml. We would see a marked decrease in breast cancer, colorectal cancer, type 1 diabetes, multiple sclerosis, myocardial infarction, fractures, rickets, and maybe other aspects of the vitamin D deficiency syndrome, which we have yet to describe. Well, thank you for your attention today. It's not, I just wanted to reemphasize a point you made in your introduction. It's not inherently obvious, but every study of 25 OHD level in disease is a study also of sun exposure and disease. 25 OHD levels are markers for vitamin D levels and they're markers for sun exposure. So it's possible that. 80% of the effect that you see in these studies is due to sun exposure and not due to vitamin D. Is that true? It, it is true. And we, we know uh, that 25 OHD is a stable biomarker of, of an indicator of vitamin D status. It, it does vary by latitude. But the results I showed for uh, the, uh, the smiley, for example, are based on ultraviolet B uh, modeling uh, and latitude. So all the latitude studies are uh, reflective, if you will, of sunlight exposure. So you're absolutely correct. Uh, John, in particular with the sunshine and whatever, we, Grassroots Health has a poster outside, uh, which maybe Dr. Haney could be at during a break or something, uh, which has indicated a very significant sun exposure level in our cohort, uh, which greatly impacts the vitamin D level, of course and we think that has to be addressed. So, totally agree. A question about the earlier slide mentioned Marfan syndrome, and I didn't pick up the connection. Uh, only uh, in the sense that um, sometimes there's a uh, underlying physiological problem that has a myriad of health consequences. So it was more of a uh, analogy than a causal relationship. Is the U.S. military doing anything with the data you found? In terms of uh, diabetes prevention? Yes, and other. And, and policy uh, in, and stress fracture? Uh, no, sir. Uh, we're uh, interested in, uh, uh, w we provide uh, evidence and information, and we, we have to rely on policymakers in the Department of Defense and the U.S. government, the Institute of Medicine, to, to uh, take that information and use it intelligently to uh, make rec public health policy. They need the rabble-rousing group just like everybody else does. Okay. <laughs> referring to your Finland study, yeah. uh, referring, referring to the Finland study, what was the rationale for them to decrease the dose in the vitamin D over the years instead of increasing it? It, it didn't relate to any complications of the 4,500 IU. Uh, I think it was more of a uh, alignment with other countries, and which often, of course, are not uh, above the Arctic or up in within the Arctic Circle. So it was a, uh, it was, uh, I think, a very unfortunate natural experiment, and it shows how uh, policy can directly impact disease uh, incidence. Was, was Codex Elementarius involved? That's the standardization of nutrients around the world. Could that have motivated it? 
it, it's possible, right? Right now, it, in uh, South Korea, the, uh, I think they have the record for the lowest uh, uh, ad advised intake of vitamin D at 200 IU. So uh, Finland isn't the lowest, but it's, uh, it's, it's close. <laughs> All right, thank you so much again, Dr. Thank you. Gorm.